Well, that's what comes as a shocker to me. I can't hang it in the class this week, or likely next week. So this is my welcome to Fundamental General Chemistry, Chem 130. Um, you can reach me via that email. Uh, and my YouTube channel, CGC Chem Mike. Uh, and I will be posting videos there throughout the semester. Uh, this video, uh, hopefully you found through Canvas, and what you'll see below, which will be a format that I should be using in the future, is a list of bookmarks. These bookmarks you can use to kind of skip around through the video. They will only show up at the very beginning uh, of the video, though. So hopefully you'll see those, and if you want to skip different sections, um, by all means go ahead and do so, or just feel free to watch through the whole thing if you already think you know what the individual topic is talking about. So, as an introduction, this is one of the things I like to do, is have you guys talk amongst each other and figure out what's going on around you. In theory, right now, there is no one around you, so that's not very helpful. So what we're going to do instead is I'm going to share. Okay. Um, a lot of people seem to mispronounce my name, McFavlin, okay, which arguably is actually McFavlin, but we just kind of accept it and run with it because we think McFavlin is easier to say. And it's an interesting name in that it didn't exist five years ago. Yep, right about five years ago is when it first came into existence. And it came into existence from my wife and I. Okay? So one of the things that I want you to get out of this class is recognizing patterns and looking for things that may seem to kind of make sense and then come up with a theory to work with it, kind of like the scientific method, which, as I understand, Greg went through and talked to you guys about um, on Tuesday. So I will tell you this. My wife, five years ago, had the last name of McFeely, and five years ago, my last name was Davis Allen. Do we notice any patterns coming out of where McFavlin might have come from as a name choice? Hopefully you can start to notice that if we get a little bit creative with an eraser, we can start to see the birth of McFavlin. Which is fun, because now there's three of us, which is why I'm missing class. Okay, but that's kind of where my name came from. If you wanted to know a little bit more about me, up to this point, I'd been biking to campus. I've never owned a car, uh, and just purchased one, because we figured it made sense that if, in case of emergency, I should actually be a little bit faster than an hour response time, uh, and then even then, actually be able to do something. Nothing quite like waiting an hour to go drive or bike to pick up a sick kid from a daycare center to then throw them on my bicycle seat. I figured safety might kind of get in the way of that. So ended up buying my very first car. Um, believe it or not, you can survive without a car. It is not a necessary thing to have. Okay, Mildly off of that soapbox and we can kind of continue. When it comes to chemistry, I've been studying it for a very long time and teaching it for a long time as well, and I am still learning new things. Okay? So this is something that you kind of have to know in and be aware of. Chemistry is a massively old subject, potentially one of the oldest. Okay? And it began arguably all the way back with the Philosopher's Stone, okay? trying to make gold from lead, okay? or gold really from anything. And really what we learned back then was that you need to stop trying to do that, okay, because it, it didn't work. What we were trying to do was come up with a methodology that allowed us to replicate our results and become very organized in how we thought and approached and solved problems. And that's really what's happening within chemistry, okay. So what we're going to go through in this class is a lot of the history of that and how people through and saw that scientific knowledge and how they worked with it. We're looking at roughly 800 years of work. That's a lot of stuff to go through. Okay, If we stack on top of that the next part of this, you're expected to cover that 800 years of work 
in 16 weeks. And excuse me for a moment. And I apologize, I forgot where I was going with that. So we're just going to continue on with the rest of this. You will need to practice and read and write about chemistry. You should fully expect 12 to 16 hours per week, pretty much solely on the chemistry. This does not account time in lecture or lab. Okay, this is outside of class. Okay, um, I will be there to help you out. I've got office hours in the tutoring center. Take full advantage of them. I will respond to emails. I'm usually really, really good about that. Okay, so please feel free to contact and talk to me. To that end, and making sure that you have your schedule set up and ready to run, I would really like it if you guys hadn't already done it already, spend at least 15 minutes and get a schedule. I'll try and get one posted to Canvas. Um, it should include 24 hours out of the day, uh, and it should include Monday through Sunday. Okay, and a schedule on your class, uh, your actual classes, your time that you're going to be devoting to studying for those classes. Uh, when are you going to work? When are you going to eat breakfast? When are you going to eat lunch? Dinner? Okay. Get that hours of sleep kind of blocked out. Okay. We can, we can adjust here. And instead of running 7 to 9, we can try and run 6 to 8. That's quite alright. Okay. Um, and make sure that you get your schedule set up and ready to run so that when the semester kind of crunches in, you're already set and ready to do what you need to do. Okay? So please go through and do that. Sources of help. Um, I hold extensive office hours, and it looks like, yeah, that those office hours are all jacked up and wrong, because I was going to look at those and fix those, so let's go ahead and adjust that. Monday to Wednesday, I should be available from 11 to 12.30. Tuesday, Thursday, I should be available from 10 to 11.15, okay? Uh, Fridays, if I'm available, will be from 12 to 2 p.m., okay? Uh, those are very kind of questionable hours, but that's one of my targets, is to, to be in there on Fridays, 12 to 2. Other than that, you can make an appointment with me via email. Uh, and you can always try and track me down in my actual office, Agave1373. You may actually have to find my window outside. It's on the west, or in the west courtyard, uh, and knock on that window. If I respond, I'm probably there, and I can let you in. If I don't respond, I'm probably not there, uh, or I don't have time, uh, and I can't let you in. The Learning Resource Center... Library 228 at Pecos. I'm a huge fan. Take full advantage of it. Uh, we will have plenty of opportunities for you to actually get points for going to this uh, and taking advantage of this service. Use them more often uh, than you think you need to, and you will do better in the class. Okay. Uh, after that, check the Canvas discussion boards. Um, if you've got questions, you can try and open up a new discussion. I will try and keep my eye on it. Make sure that you guys get your questions answered okay, in a timely fashion. After that, we're already into Chapter 1. I heard there was some issues with the uh, pie chart. Unfortunately, the pie chart isn't up there because I think it's just kind of a minor fun thing, so we won't stress about that. Uh, but the scientific method is something that I think is very, very important and useful to look at. Okay? Um, not so much for the exact details of what you're told in either your textbook or what you heard in high school or anything else, but what is missing from the scientific method that very rarely does anybody ever talk about. So typically, we start with an observation, and okay? we notice an apple falls from a tree, okay? and we start to think about why, okay? what is going on, why is the apple falling from the tree, what things are causing it to do so. And we come up with a hypothesis. This hypothesis is really kind of a question, okay, and our answer to it, our guess at an answer to it, okay, and that's what science is. We make an observation, and then we make a guess 
had an explanation for why. Where science stands apart from kind of pseudoscience and other kind of random fields that really don't even deserve the term pseudoscience is that we then go to an experiment and we test that hypothesis. We test that guess. It's not just a guess saying, okay, that's my guess, that's my hypothesis, that's the end of it. Okay, no, we test this. Okay, so we design and build experiments to then go through and prove that our hypothesis was indeed true or okay, prove that it was wrong. Okay? And the experimental part is a difficult, difficult process because what we're doing within that experimental part is trying to take into consideration a multitude of variables that we probably didn't consider at first. Okay? So it's a difficult process. More often than not, where we then go from experiment, and this is the part that I think everybody tends to leave out of science, is we actually go to failure. The experiment did not work because we didn't control the variable. So we go back, adjust our hypothesis, and we design a new experiment. Okay? And then we try and do that new experiment and see how that works. And we end up finding out again that it failed. Okay? And we tend to be very afraid of this term, failure. Well, failure is life. That's what we're doing. Okay? If we didn't fail at life, okay, through the entire process, we wouldn't learn. We wouldn't advance as a, as a society or, or even as humans. Okay, we do deal with failure every day. What we have to do is then take that failure into consideration, adjust our plan, and try again, and try again, and try again. Okay? It is kind of assumed that brilliant scientists, and we'll talk about a bunch of brilliant scientists this semester, don't fail. They did fail. If you go through and look at their Nobel lectures and they start to talk about what they went through and what they did, one of the kind of common features that keeps pumping up with our famous scientists is that they all failed. And roughly 90%, 99% of the time, they failed. So it's not even like they passed our experiments. Okay? They were 99% failures. But what they did with that 1%, okay, or even with that 99%, is they went back and they tried it again. And they tried it again. They tried it again until they got it to work. And it is that 1% where they got it to work, where they then go back and change their hypothesis and say, oh, that's what we were planning to do the whole time. You know, that's kind of science. we got to prove to ourselves that we can be brilliant. It's not just scientists, that's everybody. Okay? But it's that one success where we're like, oh, we were that great that we do it again. Okay? And that it becomes almost an addiction that some of these kind of brilliant scientists are addicted to trying to find new pathways and new reactions. Okay? And with that, I'm going to have to pause again for another little break. Well, actually, let's see if we can't finish this out. After we get a success, where we then go is scientific theory or natural law. Okay? We're kind of running out of opportunities for natural laws, but we've got lots of space for scientific theory and scientific discovery and how things are working, both in chemistry, biology, physics, all of that fun stuff. Okay. And with that, I will then pause. So one of the next big things that you guys are going to need to figure out is to make sure that you have a basic language to go along with this chemistry class. So you need to know the names and symbols for all of the elements. You'll notice there's a bunch of numbers on the periodic table right now. Don't stress about those numbers. We don't need to worry about those for the moment. Um, but the names and numbers you will need to get uh, memorized. Or sorry, the names and symbols. Uh, as a big help as far as that goes, take a look uh, on Canvas. I believe this is correct. Files, helpful chem stuff, elements for memory. Uh, because there's what is it, 114 elements on the periodic table, you really only need maybe 30 to 60 of those, and 30 absolutely you should know, and then 60 for general chemistry class is probably about what you want. So take a look at that file. You will notice that some of them are bolded. The bolded ones, you 
absolutely must know. If for any reason you don't know those, you will probably have a hard time passing this class or any other future chemistry class. So spend some time to really get the bolded ones down. There's some other bits of information that you can sometimes find on the periodic table. Unfortunately, the image I've got here isn't the most helpful because it doesn't give you all of that. Um, but most of them do give you solid, liquid, and gas information. So they give you some phase information. Um, I believe in our room you will see the solids all in black font or black ink. The gases will have red text and the liquids will have blue text. Uh, sometimes you will also find information about the metal non-metal and metalloids on the periodic table. For the most part your metals are in the lower left hand corner and your non-metals are in the upper right hand corner. Your metalloids are the things that cross between those or the transition between those and those pretty much fall uh, on the diagonal between your metals and non-metals. It's not exactly that diagonal but it's pretty close as a, a good approximation. Uh, if you take a look at some of your fancier periodic tables, particularly the, the one in your textbook, they actually have your metals, non-metals, and your metalloids colored differently, so it stands out a little bit cleaner. Okay? Um, yeah, I think that's all we got on our periodic table for the moment. So as we continue on, we're going to move into Chapter 4, and it's going to look at the models of the atom. Okay? This particular unit does require a lot of memorization. This is now our building up of our elements. Um, so while you're working on getting your phases nailed down and what the elements are, uh, we're then going to start looking at what makes elements, which is going to be your subatomic particles. There's lots of just kind of facts and memorization within this. So as you go through the slides, highlight the things that you think are important or that you think I think are important more uh, which is a little more relevant, uh, and start getting those memorized and nailed down. You will be doing some English essays and some fan letters based on some of this, so it's a good idea to go ahead and pay a little bit closer attention to what's going on through it. So, to start everything off, uh, early 1800s, we had Dalton, and he came through and came up with his atomic theory, and for that matter, a periodic table. So if we go ahead and take a look at that fancy thing in black, or black and white, that was his periodic table, or really, just up here is his periodic table. Those are the elements that he had access to. Okay? And it's not that we created new elements, per se, at this point, uh, but that we just hadn't really discovered them or refined them, got them pure enough to say, ah, this is an element. Uh, because we often find those elements mixed with other elements generating new compounds and so he had a list of potential compounds here and so what he kind of went through and did was that he noticed that certain compounds broke down into certain pieces and those pieces were the elements and he noticed that for that type of compound they always had the same kind of patterning behind them so as the example we've got the Sun on the far right which can be broken down into its constituent pieces of the little triangles uh, and the circle or sun part of it. Okay? So with that, he kind of started to build his theory. And so we've got a list of his atomic theories uh, on the far left. Uh, an element is composed of tiny, indivisible, indestructible particles called atoms. So he just went through and said an individual element is now has, is made up of an, or a collection of atoms, and those atoms are as small as we can get. Uh, all atoms of an element are the same and have identical properties. So this means if I grab a carbon atom from California and I compare that carbon atom to, say, a carbon atom in Norway, that they should be identical, that there is no difference between them. Uh, atoms of different elements combine to form compounds. So if we take carbon and, say, oxygen, we can get a different type of species that does not have the same properties as either carbon or oxygen, or even really an average of them. It has its own new characteristic properties. Um, he called these things compounds, okay, instead of atoms. 
uh, compounds will contain atoms in small whole number ratios. So that means when we go through to make, say, carbon dioxide, that's going to take one carbon and two oxygens every single time. So one carbon, so there's carbon dioxide. Uh, and I'm never going to see carbon as a half atom. I won't have half a carbon and one oxygen. That just doesn't make sense. And that's largely because of his very first principle. Uh, whoops, the second principle. Nope, where'd it go? Yep, first principle, I was right. Okay, where it says indivisible and indestructible. Okay, well, I can't have less than a whole unit because I can't destroy them and I can't make them smaller. Okay, so it kind of makes sense from his theory. Atoms can combine in more than one ratio to form different compounds. So we've already started talking about carbon dioxide, but we could have just as easily done carbon monoxide. So I'm still taking carbon and I'm still taking oxygen, but because I combine them in a different whole number ratio, I generate a different compound. Kind of a neat little feature out of this, and this is just based off of the observations that he came through. So what I want you to do is keep in mind these kind of theories, because as we go through and look at our advances within the last 150 years, uh, or 120 years, you'll notice that some of Dalton's theories hold true, and some do not. Okay, And that's going to be another important thing to think about. Everything that we're going to kind of work through within the last 100 years, Dalton didn't have access to, and yet he was still able to come up with some pretty awesome and pretty amazing predictions based off of that. So, we jump about a 100 years later, late 1800s, uh, Thompson came through and developed a model for the atom. Okay, and one of the big things that he contribu contributed to this was that we're now looking at subatomic particles. Remember Dalton's theory said, atoms are it. That's it. No smaller. Well, Thompson was able to discover that we actually have smaller particles than atoms. And that's where we come up with the term subatomic. And what he discovered is that we had negatively charged pieces that he called electrons, and we'll use the symbol E for electron, and we'll also show this little minus sign in the upper right hand corner, which I just colored over, okay, to represent its charge, and we'll talk about the charge, so don't stress about that yet. Uh, and then by kind of corollary, we're also going to have positively charged particles, and he called these protons, and we'll use the symbol lowercase p, and then again in the upper right hand corner, will show that positive to represent the charge uh, on the proton. So one of the things that Thompson was able to do was to come up with the relative charge between a proton and an electron. Uh, he could not come up with the exact charge that was discovered later, as we'll see in a little bit. Okay? The thing that I find kind of most interesting uh, about Thompson's model is really what this discovery hinged on, because we had Dalton that came up with some pretty impressive kind of conclusions on how to build structures and molecules, and yet he had no concept of this negative and positive situation. So why did it take an extra 100 years um, for Thompson to come along and actually come up with this? Well, it really actually comes down to the technology, and believe it or not, the technology between the early 1800s and the late 1800s was significantly different. And one of those big technological advances was a vacuum cleaner. Okay, well, not really a vacuum cleaner, but the ability to generate a strong vacuum. Okay, and this uh, ended up getting used to make what's known as a cathode ray tube, okay, or a Crookes tube. Uh, and so where this kind of originated is that we took a glass tube uh, and we evacuated it. We removed all of the particles from it. And then what they went through and did is they applied some electric current to it. So we've got charge over here, okay, electricity. So we've got a positive and a negative for our electricity. Okay, and at this point we kind of just thought electricity was something else entirely. And we put in a really, really, really high current, or a really high voltage, sorry, across this. 
because ultimately what they were doing was playing around with electricity and saying what kind of cool things they could do with it. And before you have a vacuum, uh, what ended up happening is that there would be gas particles floating through here. So you have little gas things, you know, hanging out, chilling inside that tube. Well, if we drop on a really large current, and I actually drew my voltage backwards, I believe. Well, what's going to happen is that the electricity coming from the negative part is going to want to flow to the positive part. Okay? And if we go with high enough uh, voltage, what we would hope is that it would just kind of jump through the space and make it to the other end. Okay? Um, but one of the things they found was that we did not get electric current through air. It just didn't really happen at any appreciable rate. Okay? And so what they did was then enclosed in this tiny little system, or this glass tube, and then pulled air out of it. Okay? And what they noticed is that as we made it a bigger and bigger vacuum, that means less and less particles, they actually started to notice that we saw a beam of electrons kind of jump from one end aiming for that positive end. Okay? And the reason why we needed the vacuum was that what we were generating through electricity was the subatomic particle of an electron. And we can give a bunch of energy to the electrons by increasing the voltage. But what will end up happening is that those electrons will jump out and they will impact an atom. Okay? And when they hit that atom, what happens to the electron? Boop. It pretty much stops, not dead, it doesn't die, but it then stops that electron from traveling any appreciable distance, and we don't see anything. Okay? So if we then pull up a vacuum, we end up removing those particles, so now the electron's like whoop-de-doo and can go flying across down that pathway. Okay? And we can see through very small amounts of particles, we can see kind of that path of the electron beam. Okay? Uh, and that's kind of cool. And so they started to play around with that uh, and use that to come up with new predictions and theories about uh, particles. One of the big things that comes out of this is that that then necessarily means that we have particles that are smaller than atoms. And this is where we get our electrons from. Uh, and our corollary there is that we also end up with protons. Because if we have atoms that are made up of electrons, that would give them a negative charge. But we know that our atoms can be neutral. So if they're going to have no charge, there has to be something else present to cancel that negative charge. Hence, a logical conclusion that we have protons. But we don't have a structure behind this. Where are the electrons? Where are the protons? We just know they exist. Okay. So what Thompson went through and further theorized was what's known as the plum pudding model. Okay. And what he said was that an atom was a sea of positives and, elect or positives and negatives. Okay. So charge kind of floating all over the place within that sea. And he said that the electrons were these kind of larger particles within that positive C, or that positive charge, um, that kind of existed making it an individual element and making it an individually charged species. Okay? So that's an interesting theory, but that's really all we had to work with. We didn't have the technology to actually prove one way or another uh, what was happening at that stage. So we had to wait for kind of some more discoveries. Um, this experiment isn't in your textbook, but I find it kind of fascinating. Uh, there was a group, uh, Milliken and Fletcher. Milliken's the one that received credit for it. He was the primary investigator on this. Uh, in a pretty fascinating experiment to determine the exact charge on a single electron. And this was done in 1911. So we haven't talked about the size of these things, but these things are incredibly tiny. Okay. But what he was able to go through and do, or what they were able to go through and do, was determine the charge uh, on a single electron through a very carefully designed experiment. And that's kind of what we're seeing within this picture. So they take an oil 
and they spray that oil into a kind of closed system. Well, the oil is going to spray out and form these little droplets. Those droplets then, according to gravity, will then fall to Earth, okay, or fall until they hit a surface. The surface that they had underneath this had a very tiny hole in it, okay, and that's what they're trying to show in that little space. And so when they sprayed the oil, every so often, a single droplet would fall through that hole. Well, in that hole, then, is a massive, massive voltage. Okay, so a big difference in charge there. And what they would then do is use a microscope to look into that chamber to see where the, or when the oil droplet appeared. Okay, and as soon as they saw the oil droplet, that's when they played with a little dial to modulate the amount of voltage. The whole point of which was to cause the oil droplet to float, okay, or to levitate within that chamber. So he would use the electric voltage to cause the droplet to move upwards. But what was causing it to fall downwards? Well, gravity. So what they could go through and do is using the microscope and having a familiarity with how much it was zooming in, they could estimate the size of the particle to determine its mass. Once they had the mass, and they knew the force of gravity, they could then calculate the downward force of the particle. Because they knew the voltage, they could calculate the upward force from the voltage. Okay? And that then allowed them to determine the exact charge on an individual particle and thereby electrons, which was a pretty freaking impressive experiment, uh, which had to require tons of patience, because then, I mean, the other thing you have to consider here is that what happens if you mismeasure a droplet? Well, you're going to get the wrong answer. So you need to go through and measure lots and lots and lots of droplets so that you can average out the experiment. Okay? That's a pretty tedious process, but that's what they went through and did. Pretty phenomenally cool. And they ended up figuring out what the exact charge on an electron is, which you don't need to worry about as a number to memorize, so don't stress on that. It was more just kind of neat in the design of their experiment. So the next big kind of jump comes from a man by the name of Rutherford. And he changed the model of the atom to pretty close uh, to the, our current version. Okay, and what happened here was that Rutherford was trying to test Thompson's model. So according to Thompson's model, there really was nothing of really large mass in an atom. We had just a sea of protons and electrons floating around, and the sum total of all of those contributed to the overall mass, and that was kind of the end of it. So what Rutherford and his group were able to do is that they were able to track down a source of alpha particles. Um, so let's just, for the moment, hold it. These are some small, charged, positively charged particles. Uh, and they aimed them at a piece of gold foil. Well, if Thompson's model's correct, okay, solid, liquid, or gas, regardless, if his model is correct, we would expect these particles to pass directly through because they aren't going to encounter anything of sizable mass, okay, or charge for that matter. So we would expect to see the alpha particles at the opposite end of this. And so what they built was a nice little system, which is pictured in the lower right-hand corner, and they used kind of a detector to detect the alpha particles, and so they kind of partnered that all the way around. And what they expected to see was that the particles hit directly straight on. We might see some deflection, but for the most part they should hit straight on. Okay. What they ended up seeing was that the alpha particles sometimes scattered way off axis. If you notice these last two up are marked actually backwards from the gold foil. Well, that doesn't make sense if Thompson's model is correct, because the particles have a larger mass, okay, or have mass, and our atom has no 
central mass unit to it. An alpha particle has a larger charge, and we would expect to just kind of blast straight through. It's kind of like a freight truck going through a piece of paper, okay, or a freight train, if you will. So something weird is going on with the model of the atom. This is when Rutherford had to go through and change that. Okay, so I'm going to give you a pause here for two things. Number one, what did Rutherford then conclude? What does that mean had to change about the model of the atom? And number two, what the hell is an alpha particle? Okay, um, This is kind of a, a neat process. If we think back to the Crookes tube or our cathode ray tube that Thompson was using to discover electrons, one of the interesting things they found there was this odd fluorescence. Okay? And that, that fluorescence, if you then closed off the entire system, still affected uh, photographic plates outside of it. Okay? So what they ended up discovering was something known as x-rays. And these x-rays could penetrate through relatively uh, low density objects. And that's kind of a neat observation. So people started playing with it, coming up with where can we find sources for these x-rays. That's where the discovery of radiation comes into play and we encounter uh, Marie Curie. Marie Curie is one of the most amazing women that we will discuss, uh, even though I don't have a full slide devoted to her, in chemistry. And that's because she is one of only two people to have won two science or two Nobel Prizes, um, which I think may have changed recently. To take it a step further, not only has she won two Nobel Prizes, but she's the only person to have won two Nobel Prizes in science fields. That's just nuts. We take this even further, she's a woman. And while you may be freaking out or saying, come on, Mike, don't be a sexist. Women are good, brilliant scientists. I completely agree. My wife is one of the most amazing scientists I know. However, when did Curie make these discoveries? She made these discoveries in the early 1900s, before women even had a right to vote. We're looking at a woman who earned two Nobel Prizes, one of the most prestigious prizes in existence, and she earned them while being a woman in a society that did not allow her to contribute to society. Okay? That is actually pretty phenomenally amazing. Okay? So being brilliant isn't the only thing you need. You also have to actually push for and have that will and determination, and this was something that Marie Curie had. Okay? So a pretty phenomenal woman. And if that was it, or the end of our story, that would be good enough. But it's actually even better than that. One of the things that Marie Curie kind of pushed for was open access to materials. And in particular, one of the things that she received a Nobel Prize on was her work purifying radium. Radium on its own may not seem like a big deal, but when in pure form, it acts as a very good source of alpha particles, which is critical to Rutherford's experiment. In the case of our radiation or our alpha particles, if we had other radioactive sources within that where we couldn't control or predict the amount or direction of our alpha particles, we're not going to have a very good experiment. Those controls were built and designed by Curie. And her procedure for purifying, she allowed the world to have access to and was able to share those samples with other scientists like Rutherford who were then able to use them to test for the model of the atom. So in kind of an interesting way, at least in my mind, without Curie, we don't have the model of the atom that we currently do. That's pretty cool. Okay. Last little soapbox moment um, about scientists and their egos, uh, and potentially chauvinism as well. As amazing as Curie was, one of the things, or 
honors that she never actually received was admission to the French Academy of Sciences, at least while she was living. And that's because she was a woman. Okay? Despite getting two Nobel Prizes, they still didn't let her in. Okay? Amazing woman. I highly encourage you to take a look at both her and her research. A lot of cool stuff there. Okay? With that, we can go back to our experiment and the first pause that I suggested. What did Rutherford then conclude? Well, his conclusion was that Thompson's model did not work, and that instead, what had to have happened was that there had to have been some central massive unit that prevented the alpha particles from passing straight through the sample. What he theorized was the presence of a nucleus, and he said that that nucleus had to be positively charged. It's one of the reasons why the alpha particles bounced, because the alpha particles were positively charged as well. And when we bring two like charges near each other, they repel, just like, say, the north and north end of a magnet. Sorry. Rutherford's conclusion was that we had a nucleus. Um, just to get an idea of a scale, an atom has a diameter of about 1 times 10 to the minus 8 centimeters, and the nucleus has a diameter of about 1 times 10 to the minus 13 centimeters, which really doesn't seem to make much sense or have any real idea of how different in size this is. But if we adjust this to something we're a little more comfortable with, if an atom were the size of the superdome, the nucleus would be a single marble within it. So we're looking at a, a really drastic different uh, size. So a couple things to note, to point out. Our nucleus is composed of our protons and our atom size is due to our electrons that are on the outside of the nucleus. Okay, so those are our big things to kind of remember uh, when we talk about them. So one of the big conclusions that Rutherford comes to is that it must also contain a neutral particle. That there's no way that we could go through and generate, um, at least based off of our understandings of physics and forces, there's no way that we could have just protons and electrons, that we have to have a neutral particle. This was his theory, um, but he didn't have proof of this necessarily. Okay. So why would he have come up with this theory? So what about having a nucleus made up of protons? So we've got protons, and let's just say lots, and then having an atom on the outside with electrons. Okay. Why do we need to have these neutral particles? What about the nucleus necessitates that? Okay. And hopefully that's something uh, that we'll be able to talk about in class. Uh, they were, however, experimentally discovered by James Chadwick, who was a student of Rutherford. Um, and a neutron is about the size of a proton, uh, but it doesn't have any charge, so it is completely neutral. So our big subatomic particles are summarized below. We've got our symbols. Notice that the symbol includes the first letter of each of the names of our subatomic particles, and that it also implies something about the charge on them. Your electron is negatively charged, your proton is positively charged, and your neutron is zero, or neutral, it has no charge. We need to know something about where they are located. So your protons and neutrons are located inside the nucleus, and your electrons are located outside the nucleus. Our charges, our electrons are negative one, neutron, or sorry, our protons are positive one, and our neutrons are zero, okay, having no charge. The next kind of fun conclusion is to look at the relative mass. Our protons and neutrons, as we just said, uh, were found to be the same mass. 
okay, within at least experimental error. Our electrons, however, are much, 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 much smaller. Okay, and so we could go through and memorize that the relative mass of protons and neutrons is one, which is easy, and our electron is one over one thousand eight hundred thirty-six. That number is a bit more difficult to memorize. So let's put it a different way. We are saying we're looking at zero point ballpark zero zero one. Okay, I think I did that right. <coughs> So, is that relevant? So we're comparing 1 versus point zero zero one. What does that mean that the relative mass of an electron is? Well, really, to a pretty solid approximation, the relative mass of an electron is actually zero. It doesn't contribute to the mass of our atom. It is really only the protons and neutrons that contribute mass. It's kind of a neat little thing. Next part is our atomic notation. This gets a bit kind of menial because this is a strict standardized format on how we approach and label our atoms. So we have the atomic number, which is the number of protons found in every nucleus. You may see that sometimes referred to as Z. Then there's the mass number, sometimes referred to as A, which is the number of protons and neutrons. And the reason we can kind of get away with using mass number is that we said that the mass of our protons and neutrons was 1. So if we just pick that as our arbitrary unit, then we can go through and say that our mass number is really the number of those particles because they're the only ones that are contributing mass. We can use the atomic notation to then display the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus of, at of an atom as well as the symbol for the atom so we know what element it is. It's kind of a handy little trick. If we add some more information, we can actually also specify the charge on the element, okay, which is really the balance of protons versus our electrons. If we have more protons than electrons, our charge becomes positive. If we have more electrons than protons, our charge becomes negative. Okay, so we can combine all of this together and we end up with our atomic notation and to give us a quick example, we could go through and use silicon. Uh, we had a slight mix-up there. Whoops. Slight mix-up with the uh, organizing of this, so let's fix that real quickly. What we are looking at is 29, 14, and SI. So the symbol tells us that we're looking at silicon. The atomic number, which is found at the bottom there, is 14, and our atomic number was the number of protons, so we now know that silicon has 14 protons, though to be silicon it had to have 14 protons. So just by writing the symbol Si, we know it has to have 14 protons. So our uh, atomic number is a bit redundant, but it's at least an extra layer of information. If we didn't want to interpret the symbol, we could interpret the numbers. The next part is our mass number, and our mass number is 29. Okay, well, the mass number is the number of protons and neutrons. Well, if we know our protons equal 14, we can then solve for the number of neutrons, because it will be 29 minus the number of protons, which will be 29 minus 14, and we would have our answer for the number of neutrons. Okay, So, kind of a handy dandy little way to go through and solve and interpret our atomic notations. So, when we look at the periodic table, a lot of this information is stashed up there. And you'll notice that I've got a little chart here 
very similar to the one before, except I've added a new column for meaning. Okay, And I'm going to pass this information along that we need to come up with what that meaning is. And we want to, what does it mean to have that many electrons, or that many protons, or that many neutrons? What, what do we interpret out of the number of each of those species? Why is that useful? And that meaning is a tricky one to deal with. But that's one that you guys will work together on to figure out what we should be putting in that space. You should be able to fill out the rest of that graph, hopefully without looking it up. The next part is realizing that our periodic table, that big giant thing that we're never without, actually gives us a lot of this information. It gives us the atomic number, the symbol, and the atomic mass for each element. And we bring this up because we encounter some interesting issues. The atomic number, similar as we saw before, not a big deal. Okay? That is going to be the number of protons. So that's not a problem. The symbol, nice and standard, same little spot. We have our symbol, in this case for carbon. And then we're also given some mass information. We have the atomic mass. Okay, so there's a couple things we want to point out here. If we go back and look at our previous organization, it was our symbol followed by our atomic number at the bottom, and then we had our atomic, or sorry, our uh, mass number up top, which is a bit odd because that does appear to be opposite of how it's shown on the periodic table. Okay? And there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, number one, the atomic number is helpful for us to go through and organize the periodic table according to the atomic number, okay? or the, the number of protons. So we tend to highlight that by putting it out front, much like if we were counting apples and oranges, we would put them as one, two, three, four, etc. The symbol kind of makes sense in the middle, and then our atomic mass is shown on the bottom, which is really apparently counter to what we've shown before. We don't seem to really have uh, a good comparison for that. And one of the interesting features here is that the atomic mass is not the mass number. Okay? Our mass number was the number of protons and neutrons in an individual element. If we take a look at the atomic mass, for most of the elements on our periodic table, you will notice it does not come out to an even whole number, which means we have partial protons and neutrons. No, we can't have partial protons and neutrons. We run into an interesting feature here of our elements. Our elements do not have to have the same number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. This takes us back to the meaning behind the numbers of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Okay, So think more on the meaning, and we'll try and use and manipulate that information as we move further through the slides.